this week we are in Ecclesiastes and we will be studying chapters 1 and 2. The three books in the Bible known as the wisdom literature are Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And they are all asking the question, what does it mean to live well within this world? So when you look at Proverbs, you can think of it as a bright young teacher. She's all about pursuing wisdom, an attribute of God that is woven into reality. And she's optimistic that if you use wisdom, you will build a successful life. But then we come to Ecclesiastes, who's more like the sharp middle-aged critic. And he says, you think using wisdom will bring you success? You better think again, because life here under the sun is meaningless. And that's a phrase that he uses a lot in this book. But to understand the book, we have to realize first that we're hearing two voices. So first, there's the teacher, or in some translations, preacher, or the critic. He's the main voice of the book, but he's introduced to us by another figure, the author. And he's the one who's collected the critic's words, and then at the end of the book, he summarizes everything, and so he gets the final word. So why does the author want us to hear from the critic? Well, he wants us to turn our view of the world upside down, and he's going to let the critic explore three really disturbing things about the world. Uh, so he wants us to be forewarned that these can be pretty intense. <clears throat> and first, he talks about the march of time. Uh, as the critic says, generations come and go, but the earth has been here long before us, and it'll be here long after. No one remembers people from long ago, and all of the people yet to come will still be forgotten by all of those who come after them. And so, on a cosmic scale, you and I, we are just stars. And when stars die and form planets with orbits of new stars, and those planets change over time, and eventually they burn out, Amidst this cosmic backdrop, uh, our entire existence is like a blink in time, which leads to the critic's second disturbing observation, and that is that we're all going to die. Humans face the same fate as animals in death. All people, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, those who offer sacrifices to God and those who don't. They all share the same destiny. All of this activity and madness, then we all join the dead men. This book uh, can be depressing. And so the final disturbing thing for the critic is he likes to talk about random nature. So in Proverbs, life isn't random. There's a clear cause and effect relationship between the doing the right things and being rewarded. But to the critic, the fact is that life doesn't always work that way. The critic has observed a glitch in the system. He calls it chance. Or in his words, a race doesn't always go to the swift, nor a battle to the strong, nor does food always come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the educated, because time and chance happen to them. His point is that you can't really control anything in life. It's just way and too unpredictable. So if you want to master life, then you're setting yourself up for a fall, he says. So now throughout the book, the critic uses a metaphor to tie together all of these disturbing ideas that he's getting ready to present. And nearly 40 times he says that everything in life is Ebel, E-B-L, Ebel. It's a Hebrew word that means smoke or vapor. Like smoke, life is beautiful and mysterious. It takes one shape and before you know it, it takes a new shape. It's like smoke. It looks solid, but try and grab it and it slips right through your fingers. And when you're stuck in the thick of it, like fog, it's impossible to see clearly. 
Now, modern translations have lost this metaphor. And so they usually translate evil as meaningless. But if you read closely, the critic isn't saying that life has no meaning, but rather its meaning is, n is never clear, like smoke. Life is confusing. It's disorienting. It's uncontrollable. So what are we supposed to do with all of this? Well, surprisingly, the critic, first of all, acknowledges the perspective of Proverbs. He says it's really a good idea to learn wisdom and to live in the fear of the Lord. He just said that it doesn't guarantee success, but he does know it's the right thing to do. Secondly, and more often, he says that since you can't control life, stop trying. Stop trying to hold on to things with an open hand because you really only have control over one thing and that's your attitude toward the present moment. Stop worrying, he says. Choose to enjoy each moment of each day. Yes, and both the good things and the bad because both are rich gifts from God. Uh, that's the surprising wisdom of Ecclesiastes. Listening to the critic is painful and it can lead you to some dark places like it may have done with you when we just studied Job. And that's why the author speaks up at the end of the book. He doesn't want you to lose hope. He wants to make you humble into someone who trusts that life has meaning even when you can't make sense of it. That one day God will clear the able and bring his justice on all that we've done. And so he tells us that the proper response to all of this is to fear the Lord and to keep his, his commandments. There's one more voice in the Bible's wisdom literature, and that's the book of Job. And uh, he has just brought to us the final much needed perspective on our journey into wisdom. John 4, 13, Jesus answered and said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will be come in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So let's begin Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And we find that Ecclesiastes, which is Koheleth in Hebrew, one of seven names that was given to Solomon in the Bible. And Jewish writings, primarily in the Targum, uh, which is the Jewish Bible that was written in Aramaic. And other names, in addition to Solomon, where his parents named him Jedidiah, which the Lord gave him, I had said this clearly, in addition to Solomon, which his parents named him, we have Jedidiah, which the Lord gave him as a blessing name through the prophet Nathan. Others were Augur, Jake, Ithiel, Lemuel. In addition to the writings of Islam, uh, namely the Quran, referred to him as uh, Shulaman, our son of David. Ecclesiastes translates as the proclaimer who stands before a great open public assembly to deliver divine words. And for this book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher is Solomon. The audience was a congregation of his subjects initially, and it's the great congregation, you and I ultimately. The divine wisdom is what God taught Solomon. Uh, the scope of Ecclesiastes is to show the vanity, the emptiness, the meaninglessness of all mere human pursuits. It leads you to the conclusion that you cannot achieve self-made happiness or self-made righteousness. Among other things, Solomon was a deep thinker, a wise man, a philosopher of sorts, who investigated the philosophical thought of the day. And if you're familiar with the scientific method, 
you know that it's a time-honored technique for investigating phenomena or discovering new knowledge. It's applied by asserting something that is true and then set it up an experiment to prove that it's either true or false. For example, one assertion may be that the temperature at McKinney Airport in August is never above 95 degrees. Then you can uh, develop your own test to either prove or disprove that. Solomon uses this method to test the philosophy that the thing that makes you happy is an end unto itself and that all other things are just means to that end. And as we study, you will find that he investigates by personal trial many of the things that the world says will make you happy. So he will set out to discover that only the pursuit of God and righteousness give you enduring happiness. For example, Solomon asserted that work makes one happy. And then he tried wealth makes one happy, good food and good drink make one happy, women make a man happy, power and wealth make one happy, the pursuit of knowledge makes one happy, gardens, architectures, collections of rare and curious things, art, slaves, servants, music make one happy. And the book of Ecclesiastes summarizes Solomon's results leading to the conclusion that human pursuits, unless they're a pursuit of God, are meaningless, empty, vain, and temporary. So we start in chapter 1, everything is meaningless. Verse 1, the words of Koheleth the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, and all Israel. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Vanity, vanity, the ultimate of meaningless. The structure of repeating this word like this is the ultimate expression. It's much like our use of the term, the man's man, the coach's coach, or the teacher's teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And everything means everything of man, since God makes nothing meaningless. What do people gain from all of their labors at which they toil under the sun? And again, under the sun refers to everything on earth. In life, everything you get comes from your efforts, your labor. And what do you have to show for it after you die? I read a story this week of the little street urchin selling the New York Times on the streets of New York. His pitch to people who paid the nickel for his paper was, I'm richer than Andy today. I'm richer than Andy today. And the headline when people read it was, Andrew Carnegie is dead. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. So it's not just individuals but in generations and empires, they all labor in vain while the signs of time continue without interruption. Verse five, the sun rises, the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises like a man pants at the end of his race. So not only factual as an observation of nature, but it's symbolic of human life, he says. And if you're familiar with the tune in Fiddler on the Roof, it says, sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset, swiftly flies by the years, one season after another, laden with happiness and tears. <coughs> Pardon me. Verse six, the wind blows to the south and then it turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow to the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return. So he says, man's labor is like the sun, the winds, the streams. It rises and falls, it blows, and then it's silent. Verse 
it rages and then it disappears into the sea. All things are wearisome. All things are attended by fatigue. More than one can say beyond measure, the eye has never enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. Boring. After a while, what we see and what we hear become boring, mundane, repetitive. And we're ready to move on. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. I'm reminded of the jokes that Sylvia would come home with from school every year. Those fourth graders would come in telling this new joke they'd heard and somehow that fourth grade joke was 50 years ago. The new jokes today were the old jokes of yesteryear. I'm also reminded of the writing assignment that Sylvia once made for her fourth graders one year. Each student was assigned a famous person to write a short biography about. One fourth grader, a 10 year old boy, he came up to her and wanted to know, who's Tom Landry? And Tom Landry was less than 10 years retired. Wisdom is meaningless. So Solomon is given a general proof of the meaningless of all things here on earth. So he proceeds now to to particular instances. And Solomon investigates the theory that wisdom provides happiness. Who better than Solomon was qualified to test wisdom? He was given his wisdom as a blessing by God king of an economic giant with all knowledge resources at his beck and surrounded by prophets priests and other learned men verse 12 i koheleth the teacher was king over israel and jerusalem i applied my mind i set my heart to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens so he explored all the natural sciences he mastered the arts and the sciences. He understood manufacturing and politics, and he understood the nature of man. I remember reading the account of historians finding Solomon's steel fabrication plant for the first time. For years, people didn't believe that the Israelites had the bellows mechanism that was sufficient to create a fire hot enough to melt iron ore. And then in the region near Eilat, at the northern end of the Gulf of Aqaba, they found the winds funneling down a valley that produced sufficient winds like the bellows of a blacksmith that would feed steel fabrication plant. And at the mouth of the valley, they found a steel plant. What a, what a heavy, burdensome task God has laid on mankind I've seen all the things that are done under the sun and all of them and all of the knowledge about them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What man finds in God's creation that he calls is crooked, he cannot be straightened. What is lacking in human understanding is so numerous it cannot be counted. I said to myself, look. I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ever ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have thoroughly experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself diligently. He says, I threw myself wholeheartedly to the understanding of wisdom and also of understanding madness and folly or craftiness and cunning and boasting. As Plato said, ignorance is a disease of which there are two kinds madness and folly or as paul said in first timothy 6 20 timothy guard what has been entrusted to your care 
turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. But I learned this too is a chasing after the wind, for with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. What God has left out, man can't put in. Man is limited in what he can understand about the truth of God. As we just studied in Job, there, were, there are questions we can't answer. There will always be twist, questions we can't answer. God's truth is beyond our understanding. How big is the universe? How many stars in the sky? Where did light come from? Why does man hunger to know God? As Solomon was saying, when we reach one level of understanding, there's this new one in front of us. And he calls that chasing after the wind. So now we get to chapter 2 and is looking at pleasures are meaningless. Verse 1, I said to myself, I find those studious sorts are apt to be reserved and melancholy. So come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. Does pleasure bring happiness? Solomon trades his associations with the intellects, the scholars, the scientists, for the association with the witty ones, the social and the entertainers. But that has also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, when made the chief good, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? Does it cover a guilty conscience? Does it soothe a grieving heart? It has a place, but it's not all encompassing anecdote for happiness. I tried cheering myself with wine, that is good food and good drink, and embracing folly. Eat, drink, be merry. Or as some Jewish translations say, try therefore, says Solomon, to laugh and be fat, to laugh and be happy. My mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. First Kings chapter 4, we find Solomon's daily provisions were 30 cores of the finest flour and 60 cores of meal, 10 head of stall-fed cattle, 20 of pasture-fed cattle, 100 sheep and goats, as well as deer, gazelles, roebucks, and choice fowl. Solomon didn't want to let his appetites control him, but he did want to determine if food and drink would be the path to happiness. When food and drink didn't satisfy, he says he embraced folly. That is, he used his vast wealth to try entertainment and amusement, the folly of the sort that only the most wealthy could attain. Verse 4, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself. After building the house of God as the grandest style for which he could be excused for, he proceeded to build one for himself. Buildings of the finest material and architecture, and they were furnished with opulence. It took him 13 years to build his house. They called it the House of the Forest of Lebanon. The Hall of Judgment and the Porch of Pillars with columns 35 feet high where Solomon gave audience to the people and where he judged cases that were brought to him. He had water systems for Jerusalem, fortifications for defense of the country. The city of Tadmor or Palmyra, which was a desert city on the trade route that still exists in Syria today, served as the retreat for Solomon. There were store cities and chariot cities and planted orchards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. Surely the occupation which Adam had in the Garden of Eden would satisfy man if anything could. The gardens of En Gedi that are referred to in the Song of Solomon in Bahalaman and Jabni. There was one walled royal garden in Jerusalem, which was a paradise of rare trees and fruits and nuts and flowers and herbs 
from all over the world. Solomon was a botanist with a thorough knowledge of all of his plants. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. An archaeologist have found the brick shoots that fed each of these tree in this large forest nursery full of fish pools of water. They were all fed by canals. And to construct and maintain these many great projects required many laborers. So he says, I bought male and female slaves and I had other slaves born in my house. Philoplandus, the 15th century Jesuit scholar and mathematician, calculated that Solomon's slaves and servants were 48,000. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. Oxen, asses, mules, horses, sheep, goats, camels, cows. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. 1 Kings 10, 27 says, The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as rocks, as stones, and cedar was as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. There were approximately 40,000 pounds of gold one year that's recorded in history. I, require, I acquired male and female singers. And I had a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. Solomon's father, David, had a genius for music too, but he used it for praise and worship rather than diversion and entertainment. First Kings 11 says King Solomon loved, in addition to the daughter of Pharaoh, many foreign women, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had warned the Israelites, you must not cohabit with them, nor they with you, for they will certainly turn your heart to their gods. But Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 official wives and 300 concubines. And he decided that's chasing after the wind. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me and in all of my wisdom stayed with me. And you think, I think Solomon was deceiving himself. He had lost his religion. He had built places of idol worship. He had been led astray by these foreign wives. Verse 10, I denied myself nothing that my eyes desired. Actually, he denied himself nothing that his senses found a delightful sight, sound, feel, taste. And the historian Josephus wrote, This is Solomon, going out early in the morning from Jerusalem to the famed rocks of Etam, a fertile region delightful with paradises and running springs. Thither the king in robes of white rode in his chariot, escorted by a troop of mounted archers chosen for their youth and stature, and clad in Tyrian purple, whose long hair was powdered with gold dust so that it sparkled in the sun. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all of my labor, and this was the reward for all of my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. Chasing after the wind, Nothing was gained under the sun. And then he says, wisdom and folly are meaningless. After disappointment of finding no happiness in sensual pleasure, Solomon returns to earthly wisdom and knowledge to see if there's something they missed in his first investigation. Verse 12, then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? Can a man on the street do a better job of investigating than me, the king, with all of my resources? Solomon does conclude that wisdom is better than folly, even though there's no satisfaction in either. I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than dark. The wise have eyes in their heads. 
so to see the dangers and pitfalls to avoid and the advantages to be gained with white light, while the fool stumbles in his darkness. But I came to realize the same fate overtakes both. Then I said to myself, then I say to myself, self, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being so wise and gaining all this knowledge? This too is meaningless. For the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. So as you walk through the cemetery, the wise man and the fool all lie together, they all look the same. And then he says, business and work is meaningless. That there's no happiness in work. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I'd toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Who knows what they will do with the stuff I left them. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil in which I've poured my effort and my skill under the sun. Even that's meaningless. The Targum, the Jewish Bible says, because I shall leave it to Rehoboam, my son, who comes after me, and Rehoboam, his servant, shall come and take the ten tribes out of his hand and possess half of the kingdom. So my heart begins to despair of ever finding happiness in this world below. All of my toilsome labor under the sun for a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge and skill and then they must leave all that they have to someone else who didn't work for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all of the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? Both in the getting of it and the leaving of it to others after he dies. All of their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds don't rest. This too is meaningless. Where are the ancient wonders of the world today? Where are the hanging gardens of Babylon, the Colossus of Rhodes, the lighthouse of Alexandria? For that matter, where do we go to see the modern wonders like the Astrodome, the Empire State Building, a person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without God, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, chasing after the wind. So when Solomon looked at all he had as king with riches and power and knowledge as a young king, blessed by God, he enjoyed the blessings. When the older backslider Solomon looked at all he had gained, all he had achieved, all that he had learned at his own hand, he found no joy, he found no happiness.